All right. Well, good morning, and thanks for coming to our session at Writers on Writing, something I know so little about from the writing side, but so much about from the reading side. How many, uh, we should know our audience, so how many people here are writers or are working on some writing? Can you just put your hands up there? Okay, good. Oh, good. And, and can keep your hands up if you've published something. Yeah. All right, super. So for those of you who want to become writers, you can throw out all those uh, James Patterson lessons and save your money because you're going to learn about how to become a writer today in the next 45 minutes <laughs> <laughs> uh, from two pros. So Dennis Lehane's already given two sessions yesterday, so um, he's, he has 13 novels out, worked a bunch of, of uh, television, on um, movies, uh, four of his movies have been adapted into a terrific, uh, sorry, four of his novels have been adapted to terrific movies, and Doug came to this writing gig a little later in life and wrote three books and got an agent and got three books published and then and they were all bestsellers. So um, you must have some survivor's guilt about that. <laughs> uh, yeah, I feel very poor. I just, I just hope they keep letting me do this. Um, it, it, it was a great uh, career transition for me. I used to run a technology company and I sold that in 2011 and had been working on a novel at that time. And as, as Coy said, I, I had an agent, and then I, I sold the company and ended up getting a publishing deal for that first book. But I, there are actually a lot of similarities, I find, between entrepreneurship and writing. Mm. You, you, you have to be self-motivated, and each day you kind of get in there and kind of write the, the script for the next day. Um, so I, there are obviously enormous differences as well, but there's a real common thread between entrepreneurship and writing that I found that was helpful to me. You... Um some, just some of the mechanics out of the way. First, um, a space where you write is inside the house, outside. Dennis, do you, do you prefer just to roll out of bed and go to a desk, or do you have to leave uh, home and, and go to a different space somewhere Well, else? no, if I can just roll out of bed and get to a desk, I think that's the best. I think mm -hmm. that's absolutely the best. I think there's a reason that most writers, most novelists, prose, prose writers, I would say novelists and poets and um, uh, short story writers, uh, they write in the early morning or they write late at night. Um, there's not, I've never known a writer, or at least not whose work I respect, who wrote in the afternoon. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> Seriously. I've just never met anybody who's like, I sit down about 1 o'clock. And I, you know, <laughs> no. No, and I think, uh, I've thought a lot about why this is, and I think it's because in the very early morning, if you've just gotten out of bed, or very late at night when everything's quiet, you're the closest you are to a dream state. And, and that's kind of what you need to get into when you write, which is, um, you know, I, I think uh, what I've always found best for me is literally skip the shower, grab the coffee, write to the desk. Wow. And, then, um, and then that's the best. But now I, I, that, that has become a real um, luxury because I got little kids. So kids change. Kids you know, change everything. You oh. you have you have a space. Uh, I mean, you used to write in a cafe, and you've got some other. I, I like to know. get out of the house. I also have young kids, and I do like to get out of the house as much just for a change of scenery. And I, I like Dennis. I, I prefer to write in the morning. I can't do late at night. That would actually one o'clock would be better than midnight for mm -hmm. me because it's just I have sort of a straight line down over the course of the day of brain function. So I'm more of nine a.m. coffee write for a few hours in the morning hours. And I, I do go, I found this great space, it's, there's this, it's like a pop-up we work. There's this, I live in New York City, and there's this company that does deals with restaurants around the city that are open for only dinner service. So from 8.30 a.m. to about 5 p.m., they open up the doors, they turn on the Wi-Fi, there's coffee, and people come sit inside this really cool New York restaurant, and you can, you can work there. And then at 5 o'clock, they give you a, you know, a coupon for a drink at the bar or kick you out. And, uh, but it's a great place for me. I like to have a little bit of human energy around me. I don't like to be totally isolated in a room, but I don't want to be so close that I can hear actual conversations. Just sort of white noise and some energy around me is, is a nice way for me to get into it. Huh. You like to be isolated completely? Uh, when it, first, uh, it depends on what I'm writing. If I'm writing an, a novel, complete isolation. Complete. If I am writing a script... I, I kind of dig the buzz. I don't, I don't mind a little buzz if I'm if I'm writing. You know, I can write a script anywhere. I, I could never understand writers who could write in coffee shops, um, but I know a lot who can. 
The, here's the other thing I want to say really clearly, and I always try to preface this. Whatever I say about my process is my process. I don't believe in universals. I really don't. I just, I, whatever, it, whatever it takes, whatever works, do that thing. Just do that thing. Whatever, it, whatever your method is that gets you to produce those pages, do it. The only absolute I say is that if you want to write, be a, be, truly be a writer, you have to do an hour a day. That's the only guarantee. Day in, day out, five days a week. You can't do it otherwise. It's a muscle. It atrophies. Well, having to work an hour every day, that must be like killer. It, it's a bitch. <laughs> it's horrible. Yeah. I have days now where th that's how removed I am from, from my early struggles, where I'll have days I'll be like, man, I put in like three hours today. <laughs> oh, my God. I think I want to be a writer. Yeah. <laughs> um, you talked so. about having kids changing the process. Uh, no, you started writing just around the time your first son was born, I think. So you... We're writing on airplanes. Right. And, and I, I was running a technology yeah. company at that time. So it was, I've heard stories of maybe a couple other writers having that experience of either leaping into writing after law. And so they were writing on trains and things like that. And I, I did most of the writing of the first draft of the first book on planes and in airport terminals and things like that. And it was really sort of catch as catch can when I could get some time to do that. Now, writing full time really is a luxury. We have, we have three kids, but I do the drop off and then I can be happily installed somewhere by 8 30 9 a.m. and and with coffee and going at I drink a ton of coffee but that's like the one besides uh, the schedule uh, changes that having kids imposes on you do you find that it uh, restricts like your what you write I mean you know I've read some of your novels and it's got some pretty hot sex in there and and, uh, and your things are uh, so it's pretty, some sick stuff goes on in your <laughs> novels. Very, very disturbing things there. I, I mean, are, are you then say, oh, kids, you can't read what dad's been working on until you turn 15 or you have. Yeah, yeah, I had a really interesting moment where I had given, I dedicated, I've dedicated a novel to each of my daughters and I gave them all the books to, for the, the, the Gone Baby the, Gone or something no, no, like no, that. No, 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 all the foreign editions. <laughs> And then one, uh, the American edition, are in their rooms, you know. So all of us, that was no problem until I came in and I found my daughter at six reading the book. And all of a sudden I was like, no, honey, no, 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 give me that back, you know. And, she, and it's like, you know, um, so they ask, when will they be ready to read a book? And I always say, yeah, 14, 15. And then they'll be like, what about, what about? M the river one and I'm like 20 you know um, so yeah I don't know but I, I feel like um, they'll certainly have to be a lot older to read to read my work so um, and it, the only thing that's changed in me which is very predictable it had already been happening I think for 10 years it's been 10 years since I had a sort of child in danger in any of my books mm. um, might even be mm. 15 but I, um, I, I became adamant once I had kids, I just couldn't go. I just couldn't go there. So there's no way I could write Gone Baby Gone now. There's no way I could write Mystic River now. But you, but you worked with kids who yep. had gone through, because you were a social worker before mm -hmm. you became a writer. Yes. Yeah. So that's where it came from. And it came from a very honest rage and a desire to call attention to you know, what I saw as you know, rampant levels of child abuse in this but country. But now that you're a parent, it's... A completely different perspective. Just no, I just agreed yeah. to take a job yeah. yesterday, and the thing that kept me from on the fence was that a, a, it's a true crime, it's a true crime uh, miniseries that I would be doing, and what 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 kept me on the fence was the murder of a 15 year old girl in the mm. in the in the story, and I was like, uh, I don't know, and I kept going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, and then I finally said, all right, I can do this, and if I can do this in a way that that doesn't pitch me into the, the pit of despair. It's completely selfish. It's like I cannot go into a world in which I can picture my daughter's face on, the, on a murder victim. And yeah. I'm just not strong enough. I'm not psychologically strong enough. So I said, can I work around that? And I was like, I can. I can do this in a way that you'll never actually see the murder. Ah. So, so you, 
Are, uh, how old are your kids going to be before they start uh, reading your stuff? It, it is, uh, you know, our <laughs> oldest is nine now, so he's yeah. into Hardy Boys and Diary of a Wimpy Kid. He's like, well, Dad, I want to read one of your books. It's absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> it's not <laughs> so he's <laughs> many years from now. He'll be, he'll, it's under his bed right now. <laughs> That's yeah. right. He's chapter yeah. three. Yeah. Yeah. It's not just about tennis and, uh, and being a traitor, I guess, and right. politics. <laughs> yeah. Now, you talk about, uh, interesting, about going into these places, you know, as readers, uh, you writers take us into a lot of different emotions. We talk about uh, reading, giving us more empathy for the people because we're inside other people's minds. And, and we talk about books that keep us up late and really disturb us. Um, and you think about people like Heath Ledger, who, I don't know if it's urban legend, but played the Joker and it really upset his sleeping patterns and ended up uh, harming himself. Uh, as a writer, when you create these um, scenarios, these uh, bad situations for people, these bad things people do, does that take you into a pretty dark place that's, you know, are you bad company that night after you've written a particular chapter? Are you pretty? Um, I, I, can, I can say that um, I've gotten very good at being removed from it in, mm. in a lot of ways. It's a profession. Um, I don't have to go, you know, I don't have to live it to write it in, in a lot of ways. Like I did, you know, certainly when I was, I was, I was a basket case when I was writing a lot of Mr. Grover, without a doubt. Um, I went to places I never wanted to go and, huh. and was like, God help me. I remember I couldn't even look at the manuscript for this one weekend. I just said, that's it, I'm shutting down, I'm out. Um, now it's not so much of an issue, but it's also, I think partially, I don't write as much prose as I used to. I'm running scripts and hmm. scripts, absolutely no emotional. There's just very little emotional investment in a script. It's different. It's a different thing. It's, too, it's truly cerebral. And so I can do all that, and I can do things, and then I look at them on the screen. You know, I, was, I, I ran a TV show that was pretty dark for two years, and I would see it up on the screen, and I'd be like, damn, it's a lot darker than I thought. <laughs> like, I was laughing when I wrote that scene. Um, and no, it's pretty grim. Wow, Okay. Uh, but that's because it went through a director with a very dark vision, and it went through a, a, a DP, a cinematographer, who could really shoot it. And when I wrote it, it was just two people talking in a kitchen. Yeah. You know? So. Mine haven't gone, mine aren't as dark in that way. Mm -hmm. Most of my books have pulled from present day issues that I find concerning or interesting. And so, for example, the last book I wrote was, the, the theme I was trying to explore there was this obsessive parenting culture we have with parents my mm -hmm. age, I'm 47, and parents a little older, a little younger, uh, and the overscheduling and overstructuring of kids' lives with a particular view on youth athletics. And so the idea for it mm -hmm. first came, I was picking up our, our now nine-year-old when he was three, coming out of a pre-K classroom where he'd just gotten a chess class. And I'm sitting in the hallway next to another dad. I'm like, you know, he's kind of enjoying chess. chess. Chess might be one of those things that sticks. And the other dad says, Don't, do you have any idea what it's like to be a chess parent in New York City? Don't do it. I'm like, What's, what's it like? And he said, every Saturday morning, 8 a.m., we're off to some school cafeteria yeah. to, that hosts a chess tournament. I'm there till 5 p.m. with my phone and my newspaper. Sunday, the same thing. The next weekend, the same thing. I'm like, well, that sounds terrible, but there might be a book in there. And so that was sort of the beginning of what became the last uh, novel. And so I do a lot of research and explore that, but I, it's not sort of mind-altering for me. You know, when I come out of it, I'm just... So when you were writing about Anton's father, it didn't make That you wasn't a good. reflection of my own relationship with my father or anything like that. It, or it was, it was more a reflection of the amount of research I did for, so the character was a tennis prodigy, he becomes a professional tennis player. And I interviewed, I, I, I tend to do a lot of research and preparation up front before I start the writing. And so I'd interviewed James Blake and John Isner and then a number of people who had gone to Boletari but never cracked maybe the top 700 in the world. So they were club pros or you know teaching pros or coaches and things. And the experience that Mary Pierce had with her father or Andre Agassi with his father, or Steffi Graf, it's, it's more common than not that there's this obsessive, maniacal parent driving uh, these, these elite tennis players and maybe athletes in general, or elite chess players, you know. So the, talking about characters now, um, you know, when, when you, I thought it was very interesting that Mystic River, which was nominated for, what, six Academy Awards and, and one two, um, and won two Academy Awards for Best Actor, Sean Penn, and also Best Supporting Actor, right? Right. 
And was a f and I was reading as I was read that this was the first time that this has happened since Ben Hur. So it's been a few years. Uh, and I, it struck me that if if you're going to write a novel and and Oscars come out of it, and it's for two actors, that the characters must be pretty good. That's what I that, that's right? what I think it speaks to. Look, I I I've said this before publicly a lot. Don't come to me if you want to learn how to write a plot. I write very serviceable plots. I don't really care about plot, and I think it shows. Um, all I want a plot to do is be a functional machine. If you care, if you, it just has to be a car. It just has to be a ve vehicle that will get me from A to B. It doesn't have to be pretty. Um, so I would def say I've written one original plot in my life. The rest of my plots could show up on any Dick Wolf TV show. It's how they're handled. And, and so w what I'm invested in, what I've always been invested in, is character. And it's the only thing I can say I'll take a little bit of pride in, which is why have I had so many movie adaptations? Because I tend to write characters that good actors want to play. And that's the, that's the only part of it that, that has me in, me in mm. it. The rest of it is I consider Mystic River, Clint Eastwood and Brian Helgeland's Mystic River. I don't consider that my Mystic River. My Mystic River is the book. So I don't take much credit for it. But I take credit for the characters. Mm -hmm. So, you, you, I think, are uh, seem like a natural storyteller. That you like telling the yarn of what happens to people. And um, well, yes, you, sh well, you should. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I do. Yeah. I so I, I enjoy the story. But like Dennis, I mean, it, it starts with getting the character and the voice right, and and that's that is eighty percent of it. Uh, uh -huh. and, and once you get that then the story can kind of flow from there and the dialogue can flow from there. Um, but I, I think until you get the voice right, uh, it's hard to get anything moving. And when, and when you conceive the story, you know, you, when, you, when the story comes to you, you must have an ending in mind. And you must have like a beginning in mind, I think, but in the middle part must I, I'm an obsessive outliner. I, I, if anything, I yeah. become more obsessive with that. And I spend a lot of time up front uh, I do a lot of research and notes and thoughts about the characters, and I then synthesize that into an outline, and then I'll do second drafts of the outline. So I, I spend months before I even get into page one, and then I'll stick the outline maybe 80%, but I pretty much know beginning, middle, end, and I may cut some elements, add some elements, but I, I have a pretty clear picture before I start. Different style? Completely. Completely. I don't outline anything, uh, which explains why. Takes me a long time to produce a book. <laughs> uh, I, I, it's a very strange. This is. I, I have a very split life in terms of what I write. So because I was trained, uh, I, I trained as a screenwriter on The Wire. That was my training, and we we outlined. So everything I do when I write TV or I write film is I outline. I'm obsessive about outlining for those things. For books, never, never. If I outline. It's crap. If I outline everything I write is going to come out terrible and, and, and just it'll be overthought and overwrought, and I just don't do it. So I like to know one thing at the beginning, one thing in the middle because it's a long slog, and one thing, one thing at the end. So I kind of if it's letters of the alphabet, I like to know like B, M, and X. And then where is the hardest part? Is it the middle? The middle. The middle. The middle. Uh, there are so many. This is the one thing we know, and this is the one thing I will tell you as aspiring writers. The middle is where you earn your pay. The middle is if you, where you understand if you truly are a writer or not. Any, I, I have a belief that if you put 20 monkeys in a room and give them typewriters, sooner or later one of them's coming up with a good first sentence. Beginnings are easy. Endings are easy. Middles are murder. And you're alone. They are the valley of darkness, and nobody can get you through it. <laughs> nobody. And, and, and I'll run into friends all the time. I run into friends, professional writers, all the time. And I'll be like, oh, how's the book going? And they're like, oh, I'm in the middle. And you just, the look on the face is just, you know, oh, it's so depressing. And I, here's the other depressing factor. Never gets easier. It never gets easier. You're writing along. You're on your 11th book. You're writing along. You're coasting along. You're like, yeah, I've done this 10 times before. And then you hit the middle and you're like, God, what do I do? Similar feeling? Yeah, no, so, I mean, the one thing I'll say is, and I'm sure, Dennis, if you meet 12 writers, 12 different ways of doing it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just everyone has their, their thing. But that is true. I mean, I, the, the beginnings are kind of fun. You're like, all right, I, 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 you know, you can always come up with the, with the beginning. Although I will say sometimes I end up, you know, I might write 10 pages, 
20 pages, 30 pages, and then I'll realize, you know, the beginning is actually page 20, and I'll sort of scrap this, and maybe it'll come back later, but yeah. the beginning can shift around for me quite a it's bit. A but the, the biggest slog certainly is, you know, right when you're, when you're in the thick of it. But I think I am assisted a little bit by that because I've got this outline that's, you know, the 45-chapter outline, so I'm still sort of like, you know, once I get into that phase of putting a few pages on the pile every day, I can kind of chug through that middle. I, I find that the outline helps me get through some of those you know, valley of death moments. Yeah. There's a great line. David Mamet has a great line. He says, the problems of the second act are the, problem of the, are the problems of the first act. And I think that's what it is. You, you, uh, there's, you can have these great ideas. You can be so excited. And in that flurry of first love, you write it all down. Then you get into the middle of a book, the second act. And that's when you realize, unfortunately, all of the mistakes you made in the conception and the execution of that first act. And then you're like, oh, wait a minute. Oh, that's why middles are hard, because any of the problems of the front of the book are going to come to light in the middle. And, and then you're like, oh, I guess that was a terrible idea. I used to say to my students, you know that moment when you get that idea and you're like, nobody ever thought of that idea. I got the greatest idea in the world. I got a completely original idea. It, it's because somebody did think of it before. And right. They tried to write it, and they <laughs> failed. You know, so. So, so yeah. when you're writing, then do you read? During the time you're writing, I mean, is is I mean, I think of reading, and you could be say reading could be an inspiration, or reading could, on, on the other extreme, it could lead to plagiarism. You got to be careful with that. And then, then there's the middle where you must be worried about mimicry unconsciously, or, or do you? I I, I read it. So first you know? of all, I read a ton, and I think most writers that I know read a ton, and uh, fiction, both. I, I'm a probably. 70-30 fiction to nonfiction, and, okay. and I probably read more of the nonfiction when I'm in that sort of writing the first draft phase. When I'm doing research and in between things, a lot more fiction. Uh, but yeah, I will stay away. You know, I don't want to read anything too close to what I'm trying to do. If I'm doing research up front, I'll, I'll read all that stuff ahead of time. But when I'm in the in sort of really in that you know nose to the grindstone phase of it. I'll, I'll read a little bit less, first of all, and, and usually it's nonfiction during that time. Because you're worried about picking someone else's voice? I just, yeah, it? maybe. Yeah, I just sort of want to stay with my own story and not, uh -huh. you know, because I, I really love reading. And when I read it, I, I try to read for hours at a time rather than just 15 minutes going to bed. Yeah. It's just such a better way to experience a book if you can sit down for right. a real length of time with it. And you really get into it. And I don't want to get too far into other stories while I'm really into my own. Dennis, you still reading fiction? I read, I, I would say, inverse. I'm like 30% fiction, 70% nonfiction. It might even be higher. It might be 20, 80. Um, I, I just kind of read through fiction, and, and, and every now and then I'll read a novel if it bubbles up to my consciousness, and, oh, this is new. But I've read so much that now I'm just kind of like, um, I'd really love to read all of these things in history that I kind of didn't look at when I was reading all this fiction. So I read a lot. I'm reading, right now I'm reading a book by Thomas Cahill called The Mysteries of the Middle Ages. Mm -hmm. And it's just awesome. And I'm mm -hmm. like finding crazy things out. Like the, the life expectancy during <laughs> Jesus' time was 25. One in eight people, li men, lived to 50. Most women didn't make it to 27. You're, you're deviating from our yes. very carefully no. detailed <laughs> script here. Yes. So I'm just saying, <laughs> this is kind of stuff like, I'm like, whoo. Ooh. Whereas novels now, I just kind of like, um, I don't feel the same fascination that I used to feel. I, I just feel like I've read through it. So, and I do it all the time, and I think about it all the time, and it's just kind of like I'd rather, you know, I, I want to, mm -hmm. I always say my best friend's a carpenter, and, and, and to, much to his wife's dismay, the last house he ever wants to work on is his own, right? He comes home, and he's like, I don't want to work on my kitchen. You know, his house has been covered in Tyvek for seven years. You know, he's just kind of like, ah, I'll get to it, you know? So I feel that way about fiction a lot. I feel that way. It's just kind of like when I come home, do I want to read a book or, or do I want to do I want to read fiction or do I want to check my mind out a little bit and give it a break? Well, I think, you know, when I go to a museum, you inevitably in front of some of the more famous paintings, you'll see a, a bunch of people there with their sketch pads um, copying some painting and I imagine trying to hone their art and... You're, uh, you know, you've written 13 novels and you've written three novels. Do you, do you still hone your craft? Do you still uh, work on your writer's toolbox? You, you know, it's like you're a tennis player. You're still working on your backhand. Are there things in your, right? And, and does reading help you with those uh, 
technical areas that you're still trying to improve upon? I, I'm always trying to get better. I, you know, it's funny, I, I'll go out sometimes and uh, my first book was Ghosts of Manhattan and people come up to me like, oh, well, I read all your books, I really love that Ghost of Manhattan. And I smile, I say thank you, but on the inside I'm like, Jesus, am I not getting any better? Like, <laughs> the first one? Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I'm always trying to learn it, and I think reading other, you know, good stuff, reading the really good stuff can help you think about that. You know, I love Sinclair Lewis. I'm, I'm not really trying to write those kinds of books, but just reading good stuff is always nourishing, and uh, I'm not like, taking classes or anything like that uh, to do it, but yeah, always trying to get better, but I think Part of the getting better is just doing it day after day. As you say, you've got to get out there and work the muscle. Mm -hmm. uh, so, And I think I, I always want to get, I feel like I'm a student for life. Hmm. I always want to get better. I don't think I'm even close to where I want to be. Um, and I just love, yeah, when I, all right, so here's a, a line I just committed to memory. I was reading Flannery O'Connor recently, rereading some Flannery O'Connor recently, and she just has a line in Good Country People. Well, she's, she's describing this woman, and she says, she had the air of somebody who had achieved, by sheer will, a type of blindness and meant to keep it. <laughs> and I just thought, damn, never write a line I could. <laughs> you know, like, like, it's just, um, or I recently turned my girlfriend on to Gabriel Garcia Marquez, and, and I've been rereading re him a lot. And I'm just, he, he makes you want to quit. Like, he's so good. He Even just in the you, translation. Yeah. Oh, God. Rabassa's translation. Yeah. Yes. He mm -hmm. just makes you want to quit. And, and, and I want to always have that feeling. The yeah. writers I know who are bad are the writers who, who think they're good. Hmm. You know what I mean? They're like, oh, this thing's easy. You know, I, I remember once being at a, at a thing with a writer. It was very successful. And, and he said, um, you know, I, I don't see why it would take anybody more than 40 days to write a novel. And I think I was this close to saying, and it shows. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it shows, damn it. You know, like... So I, I do take it very seriously, and I do take it very much as a student, and I always will. I just don't think I'm ever going to get there. And I think that's the journey. Is, is you, you, it's, it's a wonderful profession for sadomasochists. It really is, you know? Um, well, O'Connor also said writing is painful, mm -hmm. and if it were easy, it wouldn't be worth doing. Yeah, she also said, this is one of my favorite lines, she said, <laughs> they asked her, do you think that ri writing wor um, workshops um, discourage writers, and she said, "Not enough." <laughs> <laughs> the, um, there, there was an interesting essay I read by uh, Chad Harbach, you know, who wrote the uh, the Art of Fielding, and it was titled "MFA versus NYC," mm. or maybe it was the other way around. Yeah, I read that article too. Yeah, yeah, and, uh, about the like, do you as a writer, do you do what Doug did, which is live in New York and just write, mm -hmm. or do you do what you did and went to a graduate program and Got a degree in Everybody's different. You know, my, writing. my best sort of but friend in the writing business is George Pelicanos, and he never took a writing class. But these, these writing classes, they, I mean, you know, if you look at how many there were in 1975 and how many there are now, it's just been a growth industry. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and you used to teach in... I did. You know, all, uh, the thing I always say is all I can do when I teach is give you a toolbox. Yeah. I can't give you anything else. What's I in can't. the toolbox? You know, what, what, how to write with depth is my, the way I, I would put it. Or, or just to understand, I, I gave a lecture just last week at a writing uh, conference that I'm behind, and, and, I, and I just said, you know, there's this terrible thing in writing programs, which is um, what's more important, language, plot, or story? I mean, or, or language, plot, or character? And I'm like, all of them. <laughs> all of them. This idea that there is a, there is a hierarchy to this <laughs> is crazy to me. Nobody says that about a symphony. Nobody says the clarinet's more important than the violin. No, it's all part of a symphony. So story is, all story is, is story is plot plus character plus language. That's it. There you go. That's a story. And you need to learn how to do all of them. So. Yeah, I, I have a friend who, uh, who has written a number of books and is very successful. And, and when people say, you know, how, how do you do it? And he's like, I can't tell you how to, I only know how to, write the book I'm writing right now. I can't tell you anything else about any other book. And I think there's some truth to that. But I, we, so I'm, I'm reading nonfiction as it, you know, yeah. I'm in that mode right now. So you, I know you read the Da Vinci biography by um, Walter Isaacson. Isaacson. Yeah. And uh, he, so he wasn't classically trained at all. He sort of went by experience and he had yeah. no, you know, when everyone else in the Renaissance was looking at ancient Rome for, for uh, knowledge, he, he 
kind of came up as an outsider and, and learned just through experience. And so in terms of writing, that's a little uh, more what I've had, but I, I do feel insecure about that sometimes. These people who've come through the MFA programs, like, I don't even know what was talked about in there. I don't know <laughs> what they learned. I don't know what I don't know about it. And uh, so sometimes I, I do think about that. You know, I, maybe I'll like go audit one just to find no out what they, what they did in there. Let's learn more about it. Let me take it, the but. James Patterson course. Yeah, maybe I'll nope. do that. I can put it online <laughs> and do it in my now, living room. We had this thing once where, yeah. where, where we said, Tom Parada and I were talking about it, where we said we can always tell a book written by the graduate of the University of Iowa. Always. Because they never use modifiers, ever. And it's wonderful. It's, qu it's very clean writing. And they do incredible depictions of rooms. But that's like the uh, most famous. Now, there um, you go. switch yeah. uh, gears here just for a sec. If you could, I mean, writing is such an extension of yourself. And you put your name on this, and you know it's there for everybody to see. This is Dennis Lane. This is Doug Brunson, the latest work. If you could create a work and have it never be associated with you at all in any way, shape, or form, would it be a liberating thing that you could put all kinds of nasty stuff in there if you wanted to, or you could, uh, you know, you could really take some flyers, or would it actually kind of take away some of the joy of writing, because the writing is, because uh, writing is somewhat of an extension of yourself, an expression of who you are, and that motivates you to make it good. good. Doug, you want to? I guess, that? yeah, probably ups the ante to have your name on it. I, I haven't felt restricted by having my name on it in some way. Like, I, there, are there aren't things I've shied away. I've never been, you know, trying to settle scores through a novel, you know. <laughs> 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 but, uh, uh, yeah, it may, maybe, you know, probably, it, it, I will say, I, it, as much as I wish I could stay off, like, the Amazon review section, you know, there's always, yeah. like, someone who just eviscerates you on there. Um, and I read all of them, and I believe only the bad ones, <laughs> not the good ones. That's true. Yeah. And, um, but yeah, I'm, I'm fine with my name on there. I, does, I don't think I'd, I'm giving up anything or would gain anything not to have it on there. Uh -huh. um, I don't think I'm, I'm shy about going to where I want to go as a result of having my, you wouldn't my name write things that was it. more personal th uh, or showed a different side of you, necessarily. By, by being able to be anonymous? Or, right, exactly. Um, I... You know, maybe the only people I would worry about would be my family. If I if I were right. to reveal something that was really tough, in, you know, the way my dad passed away, I, you know, yeah, maybe. But I haven't really been motivated to write about that. The things that I want to write about are more what I see in our present day world that are troubling to me, and I write about that. So it hasn't hasn't uh, strayed into an area where I'd have to like sit down and talk to my sister, like, hey, you know, I'm going to explore this, and you know, well, no, in that case, maybe it would be better. Uh, who was it? Uh, Milaj that said, when a writer is born into a family, the family's finished. <laughs> 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 would, would it be different for you if, if something came out? And no. I, I, don't I, tell I, us it already has, and, no, and we're I'm not, not unaware of it. I'm <laughs> not an autobiographical writer at all. I find that I'm a very good oblique writer. I'm not an autobiographical writer. So I can see the autobiography in all my books, and so can my brother. But, um, but it is varied in a way that you would never understand it. And you'd be like, oh, oh, there, you know. So um, my brother's the one who called and said, you know, you, you, he said, you just wrote your most personal book. And I was like, thanks. And it was Shutter Island. Hmm. So there you go. Figure <laughs> that one out. Um, so uh, what I find interesting, I have no desire to ever uh, write a book where I'd be anonymous. No, I mean, part of it is, you know, it's pride of ownership. It's like, that's my book. You know, I wrote that. Mm -hmm. um, where it's very interesting is I do do, t in TV, um, you are always uh, having your scene shift into other episodes or somebody shift into yours. So on The Wire, it's, it's, it was incredible. Every time somebody comes up to compliment me on a line that was in The Wire that I wrote, it's like, no, that was Richard's. Richard tells the exact same story. He's like, somebody will walk up to him and he'll be like, quote a line from, the, from, from his episode of The Wire, and he'll be like, that was Dennis. And then it'll be because like, our scenes would shift in and out. So somebody would get credit for a scene that wasn't, theirs. And that's fine. We were all good with it. Um, when I was uh, running Mr. Mercedes, I was rewriting the staff constantly, constantly, sometimes on the fly, sometimes production, while we're in production. And I'm not getting credit for any of that. They're getting credit for it. The only time that it bothered me was I was like, that's a great scene. If somebody wins an Emmy for this, 
and they don't thank me, I'm going to be a little pissed, right? Like, I was like, wait a second. Um, but that's it. That's the only, that's the only place where I, um, I, I would worry about being anonymous. Otherwise, when you're in TV and film, it is your life. You have to know. That's, that's going to be your life. You, you will not get credit for a lot of stuff you write. And, and, okay. and what's the big motivation now for writing? Is it to entertain people? Is it education to educate people? Is it to sell books? Is it an economic thing? Is it to uh, communicate what? something? You mean we for know, writers in yeah, general? For, or? No, for for you guys, for you you two, Doug. What, what? Well, it, it, all of those things to some yeah. extent. But I mean, most of it, as I feel like I've got something to say, I've got these ideas that I want to get out uh, through a narrative, a and, story you want to uh, tell. Yeah, okay. so I, I really enjoy it. I, I know writers who, uh, Harlan is a mutual friend. He's like, he, and he puts them out one a year. And he said, man, I, I, I would procrastinate. I would rather go paint my house than start this next book, you know. And he sort of has to wrestle himself in there to go to it. But I feel differently about that. I really love it. I, it's like quiet time, time to myself, creative time. And so when I'm off to go to the place where I write in the morning. I'm excited to get there, and I, I, I actually enjoy that time. Now, I've written three, not 13, so maybe that'll change years from now, but I really enjoy the process of it, and uh, I enjoy being able to get ideas out into a, into a story, and, and then, you know, the rest of it is all also there. I mean, it's money, and it's a living, and it's mm -hmm. all those other things, too. But I think the only reason to write is because you can't not. That's a... Uh, as simple as that. Who's that, Rilke? He said, uh, you know, if you could live without writing, you shouldn't be writing. Exactly. There's a million easier ways to make money. Uh, a million. Um, it, it, there's no guarantee that what you're going to write is going to get published, that when it gets published, that it's going to be read. When it's read, that it's going to be received the way you wanted it to. There is no other reason to do this except that you can't not do it. And, and I can't not do it. I, if you drop me on a, on a desert island tomorrow... Yeah, I'd spend a day foraging for food and figuring out where water is, but the next thing I would do is look for some sort of squid that I could kill so I could create ink so I could write. I, it's just in my DNA, and I, I can't stop doing it, and I can't stop thinking about it, and I think about it all the time, and, I think, and I'm just a, I'm, I'm like a little kid, and I've never lost that. I've never lost that. I've always been a little kid, and I can't believe I'm, I'm paid to do this, and I can't believe that the lunatics continue to pay me to do it, and now I can't believe that I have this wonderfully second lucrative career in, in L.A. And it's all just wonderful. And I, and I think that you can only be that way. You have to be a geek about it. You have to, you have to think about it. You know, just it, there's no other reason to do it. Like I was just, I'll give you a perfect example of something. I geeked out for a week because I recently rewatched Miller's Crossing. And for a week, I just geeked out. And I had nobody to tell. But I just kept walking around my house saying, what's the rumpus? Because in... Miller's Crossing, instead of saying, what's up, all the characters walk around going, hey, Bill, Bill what's the rumpus? And that's what they just say. That's the, their way of saying what's going on, what's up. And, they, and it's said about 14 times in the movie. Gabriel Byrne says it at least 10 times. What's the rumpus? And I just walk around my house all the time just going, to myself or the dog, what's the rumpus? Because it's a great line. And I just love it. And I wish I'd written it. And it just sounds good coming off the tongue. And it's just cool. If you don't have that, if that's not in you, I really question why you would write. You know, to, to your earlier question, yeah. when are you ever out of sorts or grumpy or, yeah. you know, does it come from being in the space? The only time I get that way is when I haven't had my hours, you know, my time writing. If I go a day or let, you know, God forbid, you know, a week without having gotten in and gotten a good uh, amount of writing time in, that, that's when my head gets more tweaked. And my wife notices it, you know, she's like, you better get back to work. <laughs> yeah, every, 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 go back to that restaurant. Yeah. Every, every girlfriend I've ever had has said, you know, I don't like you when you're not writing. Because I get antsy, I get kind of like, and then when people talk about like retirement or vacations, I'm like, what do you do? You sit on a friggin' beach? Like, what do you, what do you, where's my pen? Where's my, I don't want to, I have no desire to retire. I want to die at my desk, I'm good. Um, and I just want to be doing this thing because this thing is Dickens' line. It's the quickest way out of Manchester. That was Dickens' line. Why did you become a writer? It was the quickest way out of Manchester. And, and so I feel like it was the quickest way out of Dorchester. In a million ways. In a million ways. And, mm. and, and, and but I, you're not in Dorchester anymore. I'm not in Dorchester anymore, but I'm always in Dorchester of my mind. Yeah. Now, you both write fiction. You read both, but you, you write fiction, and you feel like fiction communicates things. I was, I was thinking about um, 
Truman Capote's In Cold Blood, right? And it's this chilling tale of, of this uh, Midwestern family getting massacred by these two itinerants. And, and thinking about uh, Cormac McCarthy, uh, No Country for Old Man, which is maybe equally chilling, but fictional. And, um, you know, it, does it, why does it affect us differently if one really happened and the other one is made up? I mean, can't they both be as um, uh, powerful or impactful or say something about people? You know, you, you have this thing in the movies that say this is based on real events, and you, couldn't you say this is based on real crap people do <laughs> and <laughs> have it just be as meaningful? Yeah. Oh, I don't think I, I don't, I'm. I'm not sure I even understand. It, it's yeah. The reason that In Cold Blood was 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 so transcendent was because he populated nonfiction for the very first time with a novelist technique, mm -hmm. and so these are characters, right. and they come alive. And so there's a very big difference between say and hearing the fact that a hundred people died in a in a in a boarding house fire in Paris in 1862, and hearing that Marguerite and her two children perished in a fire in, in a boarding house in Paris in 19, 1862. It's immediately different. There's an emotional connection mm -hmm. to people. That's what we care about. You and know, that's what fiction is able to do. And, and, non, and great nonfiction. Mm -hmm. the, the Executioner's Song, In Cold Blood. Um, I'm trying to think of, I, I can't rattle off all the great nonfiction, but there's so much great nonfiction out there that completely pulls you in. Mm -hmm. And then you just go, oh my goodness, it's just the same techniques as a novel. You care about people. Mm -hmm. If you don't care about who it's... Ha my least favorite character in all of literature and, and film is James Bond because I don't care what happens to James Bond. I don't care about the world he's trying to save. He is just a misogynistic, imperialistic jackass, right? <laughs> the only one I love is the Daniel Craig Casino Royale because it's about something. It's completely about whether Bond loses his soul or not. And then it's about how he became this terrible person. And so it matters to me. But... That's, at the end of the day, ha I have to care about who it happens to. So it doesn't matter yeah. if it really happened or... No. Uh, Do you no. Know? I, I think fiction can be a much more powerful way to explore real themes that are going on today. Like the, the last book I wrote about youth athletics, you can read a number of articles in Time Magazine or about you know, this crazy parenting culture we're in and the, the dangers and perils of early single sport specialization and things like that. But if you can experience it through a, a story with characters you care about and feel... The, the damage that can happen with that and the risks and the perils and the pitfalls of all that and you experience it through a whole story that you get through, it stays with you longer, it means more and I, I think you can understand it better. Perfect. We've got uh, a few minutes left. I'd like to take some questions then, and then if we run out of time, you can still come up and, and ask these two uh, writers <laughs> questions. They've agreed to stay until tomorrow to take your <laughs> questions. <laughs> Sir? No, it wasn't that far. I'm not that old. Thank God. Yeah. That, maybe you think of Mystic Pizza. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh-huh. Right. And that you were very reluctant to do things, and you ended up being so reluctant. And I'm wondering if that's true, and if you, what your writing is. Okay. It's a little bit, it's, it's a great question. I'm not uh, going to repeat that question. So the question is <laughs> that, that I had a series leading up to Mystic River, and then I, w I had a lot of pressure to go back to it after Mystic River, and I, and I, and I did, and I was very unhappy. That's not exactly what happened. The, the difference is I wrote five books before Mystic River. The fifth of them I did not want to write. And my publisher said, you're this close to being on the New York Times bestseller list. Will you write one more for us? One more Patrick and Angie. And I said, okay. And I wrote it under extreme duress because they wanted to get it out. It was the only time I ever wrote a book in one year. I'm not built for that. I'm just not. Harlan writes books a year. He's great at it. I'm not. Um, oh, it's a mutual friend, Harlan Coben. And uh, so I, I wrote that book. I turned it in. They published it, and the moment it was published, I realized what the book should have been, and I never forgave myself. 
And I called my agent and I was in tears. And I said, I will never do this again. I did not get into this for this type of crap. I will never do this again. And she said, I will never let you. And then I took two and a half years to write Mr. Griver. And they were like, what are you doing? What are you, you, you're right at the cusp. And you're going to go off and you're going to write a Dostoevsky-influenced tragedy? You know what I mean? What, what is wrong with you? Nobody wants to hear the words influenced by a Russian novelist. You know what I mean? And I was like, well, that's what I want to do. And I did it. And then I turned that book in. And then that became my success. And it proved everything to me. It just said, that's the method I got to go from here on out. One question in the back. In the I don't think it matters. I call it an homage. Go. <laughs> I, I, I'm not, I try not to do it, but there's probably something that's fiddling through there. But, uh, you know, if something's derivative, it's, if, as long as it's derivative of something great, then, uh, you know. My next book will be called The Tale of Two Cities. There's no coincidence. <laughs> <laughs> it's got a great beginning and a great ending, <laughs> yeah. by the way. You've got to buy it. <laughs> Thanks very Thank much. Thank you very much. <laughs>